All right. Well, here's what I know. I know that uh, we are in a series called Walking with Jesus, and it's all about growing. We're heading into a very special week, so we're going to transition, switch gears, and get ready to do everything that goes along with that celebration. But here's what I know. I know that death is public enemy number one. We do everything we possibly can to avoid it. We buckle up, use airbags, sleep more, run, eat less fat, more protein, less caffeine, more vegetables, more fruit, take our vitamins, hit the gym, do the whole, anything. And yet we all know death is inevitable and inescapable barring the return of Christ. Death is the debt we all must pay, said the ancient scholar Euripides. There are even people today who specialize in death. I met one of them this week. I met one of the people that was associated. They're thanatologists. They study death and what it means to us and what it does to us. Every university and Bible college in the country is offering a course on it. Why? Because death is part of the human experience. We all know it's coming. And Ecclesiastes said none of us can hold back our spirit from departing. None of us has the power to prevent the day of our death. There is no escaping that obligation, that Dark battle, said the writer to the Ecclesiastes. The psalmist writes in Psalm chapter 89, no one can live forever. All will die. No one can escape the power of the grave. So whether you're rich or poor, or whether you drive a Tesla or a GMC pickup, you don't need a doctor to tell you that one of these days, should Jesus tarry, you're going to die. The problem is that most of us refuse to think about it until it's too late. In fact, that's why about 60% of Canadians over 18 don't have a will. Because they don't even want to think about it. But today we're going to study the most famous funeral account in history. It took place in a little village called Bethany. It concerns what actually happened after the funeral for a man by the name of Lazarus. What Jesus said and did after that event forever drains death of its dread and forever empties the future of fear for all who would dare to follow Jesus. The resurrection event like this one, would follow a massive, a ma it's a massive miracle back in the day. Everybody knows about it. Nobody was saying, well, I'm sure that never happened. No, nobody was arguing whether or not it happened. They were trying to figure out how they were going to deal with it. There were just too many eyewitnesses. It was frankly undeniable. And the result of it was to expedite the plans among the religious elite for the death of the miracle worker. The resurrection of Lazarus raising a man four days dead had no other explanation than it was exactly what it was declared to be. It was an act of God. Well, when we get to it, we're going to focus on verse 37 to 44 of John chapter 11. And I'll invite you to turn there this morning in your Bible and follow along. We're going to read the story actually about verse 54. We're going to read the story longer than normal today. Why? Because it, it, it connects right in, it, with the close of this story connects right into where we're going next Sunday morning. He's going to take you right in John 11 to the edge of Palm Sunday. John writes with a purpose. John says, these things are recorded so that you might believe 
Okay, I don't think I did that, but I'll take responsibility for it anyway. These things are recorded that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you might find life in his name. It is the last, most monumental public miracle that Jesus did. He's already in hiding. He comes out to do the miracle, and you're going to see him disappear back into the woodwork after it's all over. This is the climatic, culminating, fitting sign to add to John's list of signs. John writes and he said, these signs, and he gives you in his book seven of them. This is the culminating sign that point to the deity of Jesus that he is the Christ, the Son of God. Remember this when you're thinking about it, because it's going to come up. The sign, look at me, is not the thing. You see, part of me? The sign says exit. But if I want to exit, I'm not trying to get through the sign. I'm not staring at the sign. What I'm actually looking for is what the sign is telling me, and that is that there is a door. And today, when Jesus raises Lazarus, for all the excitement of raising Lazarus, don't look at the sign. Find the door. Are you ready? All right. Jesus is going to restore life to Lazarus and reveal the glory of God showing beyond a doubt that Mary's boy, born in Bethlehem, is the son of God. So John's Gospel, chapter 11. Are you there? All right, let's go. John's Gospel, the 11th chapter. Now a man named Lazarus, the Bible says, was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This is the Mary whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the feet of our Lord and wiped it with her hair. That's going to happen next Sunday morning. We'll just watch. He's just prepping you. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, because Jesus is over on the other side of the Jordan River. He, too, is around a place called Bethany, but he's at Bethany on the other side of Jordan. The sisters send word from Bethany to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. That's what the messenger said. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight Anyone who walks in daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After this, he went on to tell them, our friend, Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going to wake him up. His disciples said, Lord, if he, he sleeps, he'll get better. But Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep, so he told them plainly in verse 14, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, one of the twelve, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas, you remember the guy doubting Thomas? Hey, wait a minute. He's the guy ready to give his life with Jesus. He's going to do far better than his friend called Peter. So off they head, and they're heading back down from where they're hiding out near Bethany on the other side of Jordan, 
back to Bethany on this side of Jordan that's less than two miles, verse 18 says, from Jerusalem. Verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Verse 19, and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But now I know that even now God will give you what you ask. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went out to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha met him. When the disciples who'd been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and left, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Once more, Jesus, deeply moved, came to the tomb. The cave was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. <laughs> but Lord, Martha said, by this time there is an odor, a bad odor. He's been in there four days. And Jesus said, did I not tell you? that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, so that they'll believe you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out with his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. So many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and Martha and had seen what Jesus did, they believed in him. But some of them went back and told the Pharisees, what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees got together and prepared themselves to have a meeting, a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they said. Here is a man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe him and the Romans will come and take away our temple and our nation. And one of them whose name was Caiaphas, the high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize it's better for you that one man die than that the whole nation perish. Verse 51. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, 
He prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness, to a village called Ephraim, and he stayed there with his disciples. So far, the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father, what a story. <laughs> Lord, so many things crowding in at us as we read through and see this miraculous event that you brought about. Help us to see, Lord, what it is that we need to see so that in our lives today, your name would be honored and it would be glorified. Amen. As we read the arrival of Jesus at Bethany, we, uh, we came face to face with a classic statement that often comes up in Scripture, that often comes up in conversation, well, at least in my circle. And Jesus said to her, that's Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Notice which comes first. Resurrection, then life. Amen? He who believes in me will live even though they die. Wrap your head around that. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Jesus said, do you believe this? Look at that. Now, there's the bottom, bottom line. There's the core. So, five words about the resurrection of Lazarus. We'll see if we get to all five of them this morning. I stole them from somebody else. I think his name was Adrian Rogers. I appreciate somebody who can alliterate everything. So this morning is brought to you by the letter P, just in case you're wondering. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about the perplexity. Notice that, if you will. Jesus is standing there, all the mourners wailing, Lazarus dead for four days. Where's Jesus been? Well, he's been hiding because they were after him. He claimed he was the Son of God, and they picked up stones to kill him. And the Bible says he escaped them. Can Jesus run Oh, friends, Jesus knows how to run. Some people think that Jesus stands stern and strong. My goodness gracious, read that Bible again. Jesus runs. When there is a threat and it's not time, he gets on his horse and rides. He doesn't have a horse, okay? That's North America. But some of them said, verse 36 and 37, that's the Jews, this man who caused a blind man to see, couldn't he have done something to keep Lazarus from dying? I mean, with all the tragedy, I mean, these people are friends. The Bible says Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Couldn't he have fixed this? Couldn't he have done something? And they're perplexed. He's weeping as, as he's dying, uh, as after he's dead. And he's going with them to the tomb. And the people come to mourn and say, look how much he loved him. But isn't this the guy who opens the eyes of the blind? Couldn't he have done something? And they're perplexed. Why didn't he come? Now, before you get in too big of a hurry to chastise these skeptical Jewish folks, remember that we ask the same kinds of questions all the time. God, why did you let it get this far? I mean, Lord, if you had stepped in when I asked you, we would not be here. 
Lord, we would not be in this mess if when I called, you would answer. How often do we get impatient and question the judgment and timing of God? God, I've been praying about this thing for 30 minutes, 30 days, 30 years, and God, nothing has happened. Now look what's happened, Lord. Where are you? What's going on? Mary and Martha come out to meet him. Lord, if you'd been here, how many times have you said that? (laughs) Lord, now I'm I'm, I'm not sure. I I know you're tied up in Israel somewhere. I'm I'm sure you're you're mixed up in that. And I know it's busy up in the Ukraine. But Lord, if you'd just been here. And they're perplexed. Many of us can identify with them. And part of the perplexing thing was Jesus' timing, four days. I mean, the messenger shows up on the beach where Jesus is hiding out. And Jesus says, this sickness will not end in death. Now, you know, right, that when he gets back, Lazarus is dead, right? And so the messenger comes to Mary and Martha and says, Jesus says, this sickness will not end in death? Really? Too late! It's too late. You see, in John eleven seventeen, when Jesus finally shows up, the Bible says they found out he'd been in the tomb for four days already. Mm-hmm. When he spoke to Jesus, the messenger, he took... Jesus stayed an extra two days. The messenger spoke to them before the two days. Jesus takes a journey day, and he's already been in the tomb for how many days? Talk about confusion. Now, friends, we've read the end of the story. We can see what God is doing, but notice how easy it is for them like us to throw up their hands in despair and say, well, it's too far gone now, Jesus. Jesus, I don't know what you're thinking, but you missed the moment. You're not going to be able to pull this one out of the fire. Oh, really? And we waver and doubt the ability to God, of God rather, to work given our limited perspective on the circumstance. We want God to work on our schedule, and trust me, I'm including myself in the group. But here's what I discover and rediscover every time is that I can't see tomorrow clearly. And God can. God is always at work in, his, in the history we are shaping to see his purposes fulfilled. My frustration, consternation, or indignation can't rush the eternal established purpose of God. So what am I to do in my perplexity? Well, my task then is to learn. To learn to trust his ability, to trust his wisdom, to accomplish his plan, to trust his timing, to trust when I can't fully wrap my head around what's going on here because that's the essence of faith. His power is not limited by my understanding. Do you understand that? Just because I can't wrap my head around what's coming next does not mean there is no plan. 
His power is not limited by my understanding or by my ignorance. In religious circles, we say God is sovereign. What does that mean? Well, two things. First of all, it means he does whatever he likes. Let's confess that. God is sovereign. He does whatever he likes. And second, it means he doesn't owe me an explanation. Sorry about that. I don't know. I've just been in this position enough times to recognize that an explanation was not offered. I would have liked to have an explanation, or at least I think I would. But God answers to nobody. God doesn't have to tell you what's going on in his calendar. So why do we trust him? We trust God because through the scriptures we understand that God is love, and God is good, and God is faithful, and God is just, and God is perfect, and God is righteous, and that God acts with absolute integrity. God does what he does in perfect power, in his perfect timing, but he is answerable to no man. So you can see how from their limited perspective, Mary and Martha and some of those had gathered, even the 12 might well have concluded that Jesus, well, this one's just a step beyond us. I mean, the woman at Nain, I mean, her son was dead, but they were just on the way out of the city and you raised him. And I mean, I understand, you know, the little girl, but she just died. And, you know, it was, I mean, the body was still warm. I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was different than this. This is, this is four days. Four days. <laughs> yeah. See, that's the problem. Four, four days. Four days is a bit of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> Can't deny that. Because we come to the human rationalization for everything in crisis. Oh, it can't be done. It's hopeless now. We really thrive on that. Well, nothing we can do anymore. We can identify. We can relate with Mary and Martha because our own circumstances are impossible. Lord, they're unresolvable. Well, just the way it is. And the human approach to the problem at this juncture in the story is that it can't be undone no matter what anybody says. Lazarus is dead four days. Now, I hasten to add that if you were listening while we were reading or were reading along in your text, go back and look at Martha meeting Jesus, would you? Slide your finger back up the page to John eleven twenty. 20. Just have a look at it. Because Martha blows my mind. When Martha heard Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said, if you had been here, my brother need not have died. Now watch this. Watch this astonishing woman. She may have mucked it up a little bit with the luncheon arrangement. But man, this woman's got it. But I know, what? That even now, did you see that? God will give you. This woman knows how to leave the door ajar. We slam the door and say, well, our that's over. Oh, that did lots. There was a game changer. Slammed the door on the way out of the prayer room, bless God. All of heaven was shaking, I'm sure. Would to God we could have a few Marthas. Marthas who leave the door open when it looks like impossible is the word. Can you get a hold of Martha this morning in your soul? for some of the circumstances that you're dealing with, and just leave the gate unlatched for God? Hmm. 
we daren't miss Martha. God, give us more like her. The word Jesus sent through the messenger was surely protect, surely perplexing. But you know that she held on to the word. Did you see that? That in spite of what she could see with her eyes, she was ready to leave the door ajar. She didn't understand how it could be. But she knew the stories of Jairus' daughter and the woman at Nain. She couldn't grasp it all, but she tried not to get in the way, at least at the beginning. But she does struggle. Because when they finally do get to the tomb, Jesus is intensely moved again. It says that a couple of times. What does that mean? What's like some, all languages have trouble translating things into other languages clearly. I think it was Mr. Consulman who told me, Gemütli, you guys have no word for that. I said, probably not, since I had no idea what it was either. But he was trying to explain something about a place he had been and there was an experience, an ambiance, a, a presence, a people. It was just, uh, he said, it was gemütlich. And I said, okay. You mean it was nice? No, nah, that's not going to cut it. And there's a word here in Greek that English just doesn't quite Intensely moved can mean angry. It can mean filled with indignation. It can be frustration. And Jesus is on his way to the tomb frustrated. You say frustrated? He's literally in a state of holy indignation. Why is Jesus upset? The wages of sin is... Death. But God never planned it this way. And he is watching his friends Mary and Martha go through the grieving process with their friends. He's recognizing the emotions in his own heart. And he stands and says, this was never the intention. Have you ever stood at the graveside of a loved one and say, this is, just isn't right? It just, there's something, it's just not right. You're right, it's not, it was never supposed to be that way. That's why you feel like that, because that's not what God ever intended. And Jesus, observing the pain and sorrow, feels the anger surge at seeing human misery resulting from sin. Causing broken hearts, unrelenting grief, deep sorrow. Jesus is no stoic, friends. He's crying too. He was holy God, but he was holy man, and his humanity is feeling it. So he stops in front of the grave that stood as clear evidence that the wages of sin is death. The consequence of sin is terminal. It brings grief and anguish to all people. And it says at the end of verse 38, now there was a cave. Oh, wait a minute, where did I go? Did my own self in. There it is, second half of the verse. Now it was a cave and a stone was placed across it. Something like that. Natural cave or a rocky area. Jews would hew out a tomb within the floor, would be level, sometimes graded a bit. Historians and archaeologists tell us that they'd be about six by nine or ten, so they weren't really large. And they'd always carve about eight shelves into the rock, and you'd enter the caves, and there'd be three on one side, two facing, and another couple. And the family just kept laying them in until they were full. 
Now the bodies were lapped in linen strands with spices like myrrh sprinkled on the folds. Fragrant spices had no embalming properties. It was just sprinkled there with sort of a gentle preservative because it's really hot in Israel most of the time. And so the decomp starts really fast. So you're trying to just ward off the odor for a bit. They bind up the arms and the legs separately and individually. That's how he's not a mummy like an Egyptian one that is like this. Jesus is wound up like this. I mean, Lazarus is wound up like this. Jesus, too, by the way. And there's a special cloth that they covered his head with. And then they put it in the tomb. Now the tombs don't have a door. You can see that. There's a carved groove. They've, they've recarved the entranceway so that that rock fits tightly in. Why? Because otherwise there's going to be a stench. So this thing is airtight. Same as the one Jesus gets into. Four days in an airtight tomb, he didn't pass out. He did. If he was not dead, he is now. Four days in. And so this grave is a cave with a stone. Come to the grave. And Jesus... <laughs> Take away the stone. <clears throat> Excuse me? Just a second. Take <coughs> away <coughs> the stone? It's been, let me say it again, four days. They did not do them up like they do at darts. There was no freezer compartment. Take away the stone. The other thing I noticed about take away the stone is that Jesus is not in the business of doing tricks for public appeal. The minute I see a ministry doing that, I have questions. Hello. You see, here's the key. Jesus lets you do what you can do. You know that Jesus could have had the stone moved. Move the stone. I mean, that thing would have done backflips in the air if he wanted. He's the son of God. But what does he say? You move the stone. What? When you pray your prayer asking for God's help, remember this. You move the stone. You move the hindrance out of the way. Well, we haven't talked for years, Pastor. It's been a bit of a rocky relationship, actually. God gives you the nudge and says that he wants to restore the relationship. Well, Lord, whatever, whatever you want. What's going to happen? Nothing. Why? You move the stone. You were told. You were told that God wanted to act. You say, but that's the past, and we let the past be the past, the financial problems, the marital problems, the family problems, the job troubles. But wait a minute. Now, you don't understand, preacher. It, it's, it's just beyond. You don't understand where this sits today. It's just be beyond. Do you understand? Like four days dead, eh? Four days. I mean, we, we put him in there and we shoved the stone in place. I mean, it's done. In fact, Pastor, if you want the truth, I'm, I'm kind of glad it's over. And the Spirit of God nudges you and you go, really? Well, Lord, whatever you want. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Take away the stone. Take away the rock of offense. Oh, man, do we have to? Do you know how messy this is? In fact, that's exactly where Martha's going. Martha says, Lord, by this time the body will have a nasty odor. 
The old King James that my best friend's favorite words are, he stinketh. Exactly that. Martha's in a mess. At this moment at the graveside, whatever faith she had hours before is now buried again in sorrow. Jesus says, roll away the stone and the logic of it. Or the illogic just jabs her like a knife. Lord, we put this behind us. I mean, this is hard, but he's gone. In other words, her thoughts are not on faith, but on the circumstance. She's focused on the state of the corpse, not the command of the Christ. Did you hear me? She's focused on the state of the corpse, not the command of the Christ. She's visualizing the decom. Oh, Lord, I mean, who wants to see it? You move that stone, and this is going to get really nasty. Lord, there's a problem. Don't you understand, Lord? It's too late. It's too long. He's gone. Lord, the smell's going to be outrageous. Friends, our hard and impossible circumstances are not overwhelming issues to God. His power transcends our trouble. His power is not limited by our past, by our failures, by our struggles with faith or our hope. Jesus has resurrection power. Isn't that what he told her? I am the resurrection and the... And in order for resurrection to, to work, you do understand that something has to die first, right? <laughs> His power is not limited. He can bring victory when we gave up hope. He is able to bring victory long after hope seems unreasonable. And he calls to you and to me to live by faith and to trust him. He calls us to roll away the stone, to get the hindrance out of the way so that he can begin to work. Now you got to listen for the voice of the Spirit. I know people have put their hand back in the garbage pail and, oh my Lord, I wasn't sure what they were doing, but I hoped it was Jesus. And it wasn't. It was just messy. Friends, listen for the voice. My sheep hear my voice. Hello? Make sure you hear the voice of the shepherd. However, don't limit the shepherd. Because has, has not he said, has not he, he said, come on back to me. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. So now at the critical moment, Martha can only see the problems. She's got tunnel vision. She's entirely one of us. All she can remember and think about is the stink and the disruption of propriety and the nasty remnants of a problem that apparently Jesus didn't have time to fix. Lord, why? But you got to get there because I, I, I got to tell you that it's only after the problem that you get the promise. And the promise comes in the midst of all this stuff, and that's verse 40. And Jesus says to Martha, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Martha, I spoke to you. He reminds her once more of the promise that he had made. This sickness will not end in death. Do you know that there's more than one way to read that? I can say this sickness will not end in death, or this sickness will not end with death. In other words, there is more to be... Oh, wait a minute. And which way was Jesus reading? Hmm. 
He did not say there would be no death. He said quite specifically that it would not end there. And then in verse 25 and 26, he turns around and encourages her to believe. If you believe, if you would believe, Martha, you would see. What would she see? Oh, she would see a miracle, of course. She's going to see a miracle. Lazarus is going to be raised. Remember what I said about the sign and the door? Jesus said, don't stare at the sign, Martha. Here's the thing. I need you to adjust your set. I need you to adjust your vision because I want you to see... Why does that matter, preacher? Isn't it great that he gets raised from the dead? What is the glory of God? Well, the glory of God is the revelation of God's character and person. You can see God's glory. When it's in use, you can see his mercy and his grace and his goodness and his unfailing love and his judgment and justice and the truth of his words. God's glory is not a shiny light. It's a shiny light because of the infinite perfection and purity of Almighty God. But what is it? The glory of God is the character and nature of God. And Jesus said to Martha, watch this. You're going to see the character of God show up. In other words, you're going to see me for who I am. If there's any doubt in your mind, Martha, you're going to see something. But you have to believe so that you can see. Isn't that what John said in chapter 1, verse 14? We saw his glory. The glory of the one and only, full of grace and truth. What did they see? The pure, unadulterated love, goodness, kindness, character of God. What difference does it make if she sees the glory of God or if she just celebrates the resurrection of Lazarus? Paul, 2 Corinthians 3. Now the Lord is the Spirit or the Holy Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is present, there is freedom. That's not freedom to wave a flag. Don't go there. That's knucklehead stuff. Freedom is the freedom to change. Don't take the verse where it's not supposed to go. What is the freedom? In the context, Moses keeps meeting with God and he gets this glowy face, but he puts on a mask. Why? Because the glory is fading. It doesn't stick. So he has to repeatedly go into the presence of God just to renew the glow. Oil of Olay, I guess. Kind of a nightly thing. But there's a difference between where we are and where he was. And that's what Paul's after here. He said, here is the problem is that Moses could see, but he didn't have the power to change. And we all now, unlike Moses, with unveiled faces, are reflecting the glory of the Lord. And we are being what? transformed. Martha, if you'll believe, you're going to be transformed. I'm going to change you. I'm going to change you in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. You're going to see it, and it's going to, you're going to be it. It is going to be right there by the power of the Spirit. If you can see it, it's coming. Your, the character and nature of God is going to begin to reshape the outline of who you are. Martha, you're not going to be the same woman if you can believe so you can see the glory of God. Don't watch for the sign, Martha. Watch for the door. So, 
Did you see the sign or the door? That's what I want to know. Can you see? And that's what Jesus is after here. That's why it's significant that we believe. Why? Because if you don't believe, you can't see. What did Jesus tell Nicodemus? You must be born from above. Why? He that does not believe cannot do what? See the kingdom of God. If you can't see it, you can't be transformed by it. You need to be able to see. So, is Martha going to get there? Is that going to be her experience? Well, I'm telling you that I don't know. But I'm telling you that that's what Jesus was trying to get at her. All in John's gospel, every miracle is a sign. And he says that right at the beginning. And he reminds you at the end, don't look at the sign. Well, there's a wedding in Cana in Galilee. You remember this? Wedding at Cana in Galilee. Jesus goes to the wedding and they run out of wine. And there's a miracle. He turns the water into wine. Pause. Did you see the sign? Or did you see the door? Pardon me? What did Jesus just do? Mary said before she left, whatever he tells you to do, that's what you're going to do. And what did he do? He said, take what you have. What did they have? Seven stone water pots. And go get some water from the well. Why? Because that's what you have. He said, I'm going to take what you have and supply what you need. Don't go out looking for the LCBO to be open. I'm going to take what you have and I'm going to supply what you need. How many of you saw that? If you didn't, that's called seeing. Jesus was trying to show them, I'll take the water pots that you have available. I'll get you to do some work. Fill them up. I'm going to get you to scoop some out by faith. And I'm going to ask you to take what's in the scoop and give it to the guy who knows. In your circumstance today, your heavenly Father is ready to take what you've got and turn it into what you need. Hello? But you got to listen. you got to follow the instruction. But that's a fabulous promise, isn't it? The glory of of God. How does that apply? If Martha sets her heart on the corpse, she's going to see a living body, and that will be wonderful. But if Martha sets her heart on seeing the glory of God, she will see Jesus as the Christ, and she will be transformed by the truth. Isn't that what Jesus said to her? I'm the resurrection and the life. He who does what? Oh, there it is. He who believes in me. Watch what's going to happen, Martha. If you'll believe in me, you will live even though you die. And whoever lives believing in me will what? That's yours, Martha. Take it. Take it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17... Paul turns this around and makes me uncomfortable. For our momentary light suffering is producing for us. Did you know that your trouble is producing? Some of you thought this was the stone wall. You say, I'm having trouble. Good. Paul says it's producing. Paul says our light and suffering is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. It's producing for us what? Glory, the character and nature of Christ within us. It's an eternal weight of glory. It's something beyond your comprehension, what's happening to you, far beyond all comparison. Why, Paul says, because we're not looking at what we can see, but we're looking at what we can't see. For what is seen is temporary. Lazarus is going to die again. Just a heads up. Spoiler alert. 
But what is not seen is what? If you can take on the character and the nature of God, you are being prepared for a kingdom that is coming. Hello? Jesus is making you into Jesus. Hallelujah. You are never going to be him, but you can be like him. And he will transform you in the midst of your troubles if you can see. Somebody said to me, Pastor, why do we stop changing? I said, the only reason I can think of that we stop changing is that we stop seeing the glory of God and keep seeking the miracle. Jews look for a sign. Did you see that? And the Greeks look for understanding. But Paul said, but we preach Christ crucified. A revelation. The glory of God. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. Hmm. Then comes the prayer. So they took away the stone. Martha gives them the nod. Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you. You've always listened to me. I know you always listen to me. Why is he praying this? Because he wants them to see. He didn't pray because he needed a prayer. He didn't need a top up of his faith, he prayed, <clears throat> pardon me, 24th puberty today, I don't know what's going on with the voice, but anyway, he prayed for the sake of the crowd that was standing there so they could believe, and then what comes, well, after the prayer, knock him bed, here comes the power. And when he had said this, the Bible says, he shouted in a loud voice. That's the critical moment because now he shouts, and you know that, you know, Lazarus was not at the door already, right? He shouts, Lazarus, come forth, and and you could have heard a pin drop. Everybody's just staring at the door. And then a little noise. No, it's just the rats, Martha, don't worry. And then out he comes <laughs> and blows their mind. The command of Jesus proved that he was more powerful than death, that he could call on death, our greatest enemy, to give up its victim, relinquish its grasp, and that he would be victorious. D.L. Moody said if he hadn't said Lazarus, Hades would have emptied that afternoon. And half of it did a week later, but you'll have to come back to hear about that. So with hearts pounding, they stand outside the grave. And the dead man came out, verse 44. Whoops, how did I get to thank you? (laughs) Prayer? Yeah, we're going to do that in just a second. There we go. The one who had died came out, his feet in his hands tied up with strips of cloth and a cloth wrapped around his face. And Jesus said, cloth be unwrapped. Let liberty reign. Balderdash. He said to who? To them. You do it. You unbind him. You help him unbind from all that problem and all that trouble. Let's get this whole thing reconciled. I've got this man alive, healed, restored, and ready. Now you let him go, and let's have life together one more time. Amen? Amen. Friends, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And if we can see him in the midst of the signs, in our light and momentary troubles, if we can see him, we can have those moments be life-transforming moments when we are shaped into the character and nature of God, which is the goal of God for every one of us. So Jesus was four days late answering the prayer. 
Four days late, healing Lazarus. Four days later than the faith and hope of most of the people who stood around would allow for. Jesus was four days late, but Jesus was right on time. Where do you need him today? God may not deliver you when or how you expect him to. He may not give the answer to you that you think you need until it seems like it's far too late. But remember that the answer of God, the word of God, has resurrection power. It gives life and transforms. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning again for teaching us from your word of your power. We thank you for the tremendous illustration of our own resurrection that will happen one day as you loved Lazarus and you love those who are your own. Thank you, God, that like him we will rise on the day when the shout comes and the trumpet calls. We too, like Lazarus, will come forward. Lord, as you came by Bethany, someday you'll come by this world and you'll say to us, come forth like you did to him. And God, we are looking forward to eternal life in all of its fullness. And we thank you, Lord, for this demonstration of your transforming power, able to help us to walk in newness of life even now. Lord, help us to see, to get our eyes off the problems and fix our eyes on the glory of God that we might be transformed in the moment into your image and radiate, radi uh, radiate your excellencies, your, your glory by the energy of the Spirit who is at work in us. We thank you in the name of Jesus that you are the resurrection and the life we give glory to your name because you're a good God who does good things for his people. We celebrate you today in the midst of our troubles and our trials and our difficulties. We celebrate you because you're a good God. You're a faithful God. You're a loving God. You're a God who works in the hearts of his people for the glory of his own great name. Spirit of God, come into this house and transform those who would see. For the glory of your name, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.